Hi, and welcome to Diversity in the Community. I am your host, Teresa Harris. I am so excited to have this young man back on the program, uh, Michael Wilson. I'm going to let him tell you, um, introduce himself and tell some things about him and what he does. I had him on the show uh, a few years back, and I had a bunch of questions I was going to ask him. But he is so full of historical information, I didn't get a chance to ask most of those questions. And I learned this time, I said, this time I'm just going to let him talk about whatever he wants to talk about. So again, I've been knowing this young man since he was a child. And I am just so proud to um, share this platform with him today. And uh, with that said, Michael, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Sister Teresa. It's good <laughs> to be here. Thanks again for inviting me. I, I enjoyed myself the last time. and I'm yeah glad to be back here. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, you had asked me to ask, uh, give you some questions, you know, some topics. So today I probably talk a little bit about, you know, some people who lived here in Connecticut, you know, the achievements that they made, mm -hmm. and also some, some serious issues that I think we really need to address that happened then that we really haven't addressed today that impact us mm -hmm. economically and politically. So again, you know, for those who don't remember, my name is uh, Michael J. Wilson. Uh, I grew up, you know, in this area, went to uh, Northwest Catholic, graduated there, then went off to uh, Hampton University down in Virginia where I got my start in history and started my journey of uh, archaeology and being a student there and getting into to art and, and really delving into our history. And so when I came back from Hampton, you know, my undergraduate with thesis was on the history of colonial New York City mm -hmm. um, and the role that what we call scientific racism played in creating a false image. So, you know, that right there has been my passion and I was able to meet uh, Dr. Warren Perry, who was uh, one of the very first uh, archaeologists that focused on the archaeology of the African diaspora. And he was actually also the um, director, archaeological director of the African burying ground in Lower Manhattan. Uh, a lot of people don't know, uh, but Lower Manhattan was actually the first Harlem. That mm -hmm. was actually called Little Africa. And there was a man, when it was uh, colonized or occupied by the Dutch, a man named Simon Congo, who actually owned all of the land from what is the Wall Street all the way up to about 34th Street, all the way up into the year 1664. Mm -hmm. And that's when the British came and they took over what was then New Amsterdam and created New York because, uh, and then Harlem as we know it was, a, an, a, the original Dutch town is actually spelt with two A's. So when the British came and took over, they Anglicanized it and took out the second A and then it became Harlem. And they let the Dutch keep the Bronx and uh, Brooklyn and the uh, British took over and kept Manhattan. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Uh, what does uh, African what did you say, diaspora? What yeah, the, the African, that means that where, where our ancestors started from Africa and then dispersed throughout the world. So when okay. we talk about the diaspora, where did we go? So a lot of the times we have to really look at, you know, during the uh, trade in African captives, one of the things that uh, we don't use at the Center for Africana Studies and ALADS, which is the Archaeology Laboratory of African and African Diasporic Studies at Central Connecticut State University. Uh, one of the words that we don't use is the word slave because number one, it, it, it's not who we are. When you look at the linguistical origins of the word slave, it's actually Eastern European and it comes from the Slavic peoples. And these were the original ones who the Franks and the Turks were enslaving. So this is where we get the word slave so because there was no slavery ever in Africa as we know where we're trading each other for human beings for profit. There was never that business prior to the Arab and the European coming to the continent of Africa. Now, there were three ways that you could pretty much be indentured or put, put in service. And one was uh, you committed a crime because you have to remember the continent of Africa was very abundant. So we have a very communal system. We are, as, a, as Dr. John Henry Clark used to say, we are a we people, mm -hmm. not a me people. So we are, we've always had a collective consciousness where we, we are our brother and sister's keeper. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we never had that. But there were ways if, you number one, you were a thief. 
There's a book that I always recommend that I start off with. It's called Sundiata, an Epic of Old Mali, and it talks about the first king of Mali, Sundiata, how he became there. Um, and my, many people might not know Sundiata, but they do know, uh, many of have heard of his great grandson, mm -hmm. uh, Mansa Musa, who Forbes yeah. magazine has recognized as the richest man in the world. But that's a, a whole a whole nother topic right I, I there. I remember the day because when I was in uh, one of the plays at the Bushnell, um, um, we were talking about that. So that's what I remember, and that's why I was kind of smiling. Oh, I recognize something that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so a lot of people talk about how Mansa Musa was the richest man in the mm -hmm. world, but we have right. to remember that the trade route that he had had already existed for almost a thousand years prior to Mansa Musa coming to the, to the throne, mm -hmm. you know, because we had the empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And these, uh, these were civilizations that lasted for over a millennium living in peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we, we look at that right there. And so as I was saying, the only ways that you could have been, you know, held in, in servitude was one, you stole because everything was in abundance. So mm -hmm. all you had, you know, every day was, that's why we have, you know, that Southern hospitality. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from because, you know, you go down South and even when you go to black folks' homes today, you know, they, if you, you don't offer them food, you're going to be called rude. <laughs> You know, Grandma always said, don't eat all the food on it and leave some for people to come, yeah. you know, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so you don't have to steal because we were abundant. So if you were stealing it, it showed a flaw in character. Mm -hmm. Then the other way was, you know, you were just bad with money. You kept, I kept buying, hey, hey, Sister T, you know, you know, I'm kind of low on money. You know, I need to borrow to, and I keep asking you, and I never pay you back, and now I'm indebted to you. Mm -hmm. So now... I've, I have to pay off that debt through service or whatever. And then the f other way was you were a war captive. Now remember, when our ancestors waged war, it's not war as we know today. Mm -hmm. You know, it was mostly done through, you know, um, you know, wrestling, battling, but if there was any death, that was considered a, a bad omen. A lot of the times what we would do, because we were a, a moral and civilized people, mm -hmm. you know, let's get away from being cannibals. There's no uh, documented evidence of Africans ever eating Africans. Now, if you want to really? know, really, really, there's no documents of, of African cannibals prior to the European and the Arabs coming in. That's not our culture. They, you, can, you, you know, when you look at the historical documents, you know, when Hawkins and all the early <clears throat> explorers went into the continent, mm -hmm. you know, there's no evidence of them mentioning any of that. If anything, you hear them waiting for the men to leave. You look at their writings. You know, uh, there's a, uh, I tell people there's a, a, a great volume called Documents Illustrative of the North American Slave Trade, mm -hmm. and it's uh, Elizabeth Dolan. And I mean, it just talks about, you know, how they went in and just a straight commodity and, you know, just just barbarism, mm -hmm. you know, savagery to sit down okay. and scout a people and wait for the men to leave to steal the, the elderly men, the women and the children mm -hmm. and to do some some of some some of the most heinous things to women and children that we don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But, right. you know, this, the, the, we're, deal, we're dealing with war and the reality of it is we are dealing with a a savage and barbaric people. Mm -hmm. And that's where people don't realize that when Alexander came into the Nile Valley in 332 BCE, he was the first Western Asian because there is no co continent called Europe. That is Western Asia. Okay. You see? Um, and so when he came into um, Northeast Africa in Africa, which is Northeast Africa, we today we know as the so-called Middle East. But there is no Middle East, that's just a political term. That is all Africa. It's on the African tectonic plate. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that area today from what we know as Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all that is technically Northeast Africa. Okay. A lot of people okay. don't realize that. And the oldest Christian church is called the Hagia Sophia and it's in Istanbul, Turkey. And so this is where a lot of the very first ecumenical councils mm -hmm. took place. The council of uh, a lot of people, if they've studied, you know, the history of Christianity and Christology, you start with the first ecumenical council of Nicaea in 325. Mm -hmm. Then you have the council of Constantinople 
and 381, and then you also have the Council of Ephesus and the Council of, uh, was that 351 AD, and then the Council of Chalcedon in 381. And these uh, were actually all governed by what we call the Melkite Coptic priest out of Memphis, Egypt. And these were all men of color, African men. So when we think about the theology and the philosophy of what we know as Christology, which begets all the religions from Christology, you get the religions of Judaism mm -hmm. and Islam. Because what a lot of people don't know is that the very first Christian church is also the very first Islamic mosque. It's the Hagia wow. Sophia. And so when Mohammed II in 1453, he conquered Byzantium, which was the seat of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now in 1443, 39 actually, they moved the see of Christianity from Byzantium first to a curia or a college in Florence, and then it moved to what we know as the Vatican in Rome today in 1445. So Roman history as we know it doesn't begin until 1445. Any Roman, what we call Roman history is actually Latin history. See, there's no Rome because Rome was just a vassal state at that time. It didn't become powerful until it begot, be, became the see of Christianity in 1445, and that's when they built mm -hmm. the Vatican. But also, it was controlled by this time by the banking families of Europe, the Borgias and the Medicis. And these were some very greedy and notorious people because they created what we now know as the doctrine of discovery, which pretty much says that Africans are pagans and slowless beings that need to be enslaved. This comes from the Vatican. Wow. The doc look it up, the doctrine of discovery, the papal bulls. And these are what they issued for the Portuguese. First, the, the, the trade in our ancestors started with the Portuguese, mm -hmm. then the Spanish, you know, then the Dutch, and then the British came on board. Mm -hmm. You see, um, there's a book called Europe and the People Without History by Eric Wolf, and he documents a lot of, a lot of that, what was going on during that period um, between, 14, between the 1450s all the way up until, you know, the, the 1700s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we realize is that, you know, you have, you know, the King James version of the Bible, right. which, you know, comes because it was created in 1611. But remember, King James chartered the Plymouth Company, which was a, a charter to settle the North American continent. You know, so this side on here. So he sat down there to create a Bible, you know, to give him control. Because remember, I went to Catholic school. Catholics don't use the King James Version of the Bible. They have the Douay Reims which is a completely different Bible. Because remember that in 1550, uh, 1517, you had the Protestant Reformation. And in the Protestant Reformation, remember Martin Luther never was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. What he was protesting were the indulgences. Uh, if you remember, the, uh, they're selling the indulgences. So in Catholic, you have purgatory, mm -hmm. you know. So if you want to get your, 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 your loved one out of purgatory, you got to get an indulgence so, and pay. Uh, so I was going to ask you, what, what does indulgence mean? So an indulgence is a payment. You got to oh, pay no, the okay. priest all right, all right. so to sit down and pray for your, pay, your, your loved one to get out of purgatory. And so, you know, with all the corruption, you know, and the greasing of palms going on, Martin Luther, you know, put up, you know, the 95 Theses to protest the corruption of the Catholic Church. And this is why you get the Protestant religion. It's still part of the Catholic Church, a lot of people forget that, mm -hmm. but it's still part of mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. And this is why there's another book that people should read called um, uh, Capitalism and Slavery, you know, because when you look at Protestantism and capitalism, they go hand in hand, mm -hmm. you know, because it's all about the exploitation. And so through that, how do you justify, you know, enslaving a, a people? you know, as, as Christians, you know, you have a religion which says God is love, but you're now enslaving people, you know, so how, how do you sleep at yourself at night? You know, so you have to come up with a theology or ideology that we are not human, mm. you know, no. to justify this. 
And, and again, this is something that's gradual because, you know, when the colony was settled in the, in, uh, the 1600s, you know, by the British, you know, <clears throat> there, were no, there was no such thing as race. Uh, I believe there's a book called The Invention of Whiteness by Theodore Stevens, and he talks about, you know, how race was a social and political construct that was created. And you can see that, and in America, it, it was a, the very first one uh, where we start seeing the spatialization and classification of races after 1676, Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. And this is when the, 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 the working class, or what I would say the white slaves, because they were white slaves before they were African slaves, they, but they were called transporters. They were transported, so these were mostly Irish and peasants uh, of, of the English class who, were committed, who committed petty crimes. Mm -hmm. And it was either go to the guillotine or to, to be hung, or you get transported to the New World. And, the, so and remember, serfdom was slavery. It's just, the, it's just their way to not say that it was slavery, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. It was slavery. That's what it was. See, our ancestors were enslaved. The Europeans and them, they were serfs, they were slaves. That's where slave began. It began in Europe and it began long before we were on the scene. So that's why, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, this whole idea now of identity politics, mm -hmm. you know, how can you sit down and, and, and talk about your gender? I, and, and that's, I could care less. That, that, that's your choice, but you want to sit down and project a word called slave, a people who have no connection to me. My ancestors do not come from Eastern Europe. Number two, archaeologically, when we look at the evidence, our ancestors never accepted that condition. We were always constantly resisting. You see, the very first Africans to actually resist on this kind that we can document was um, in 1526. And by the Spanish, we forget that the Spanish had colonized up, you know, the Florida was a Spanish colony. Mm -hmm. We forget that. <clears throat> and so before the Dutch or before the Spanish, I mean, the British came, uh, the Spanish had brought a group of Africans with them. And they were from uh, West Central Africa, mostly uh, Congo, Angola region. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they got off the ship in Winya Bay, what did they do? They revolted and ran away. We don't forget this. Now, who are those Africans? Those Africans were called Cimarroons or runaways, and that word eventually became known as what? Seminoles and Maroons. So the Seminole tribe that we hear are actually began, got their beginnings as runaway Africans. And they maintain that, and we forget about that because when, the, when you read the historical documents again, read what they say. Because when you look at when they came, that area was uninhabited. There was nobody there. So it was, our, it was those runaway Africans who became the Seminole Nation. So in 1832, when Andrew Jackson, who, who uh, before he became president, when he was fighting the Seminoles, you know, let's, uh, and uh, you know, today we have to use the N-word, but he said, this is not a war with Indians, this is a war with, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we have to understand that they know this. And, you know, so we have to understand why, why does this country not want us to be full citizens? We have to ask that self. Is it a coincidence that just recently uh, one of the politicians said African Americans vote just as much as Americans in 2021? Is this, or 2022, is that a Freudian slip? When are we going to realize? And I tell people, we are not citizens because when the framers created the Constitution, they put in that unique clause called the three-fifths. All right, now, what they give us the lie. See, we have to look at the trickery. They say, oh, we put in the three-fifths to determine, you know, votes. But remember, we had a very free, we, po black population, prior to the ratification of the Constitution. Now, one of the first people who I studied after I left Hampton and graduated Hampton, came back here and wanted to get into archaeology, mm -hmm. um, was a, a man named uh, Brotier Venture Smith. 
And now, Brotier, uh, you know, and it, you can read his narrative in a book called Five Black Lives by Anna Bonatomps. And it's his and many others. And these are black, five black men whose lives are here in the greater Hartford area, okay. you know. So it's a great book to read. Uh, Brotier's is actually, along with Aluda Equiano, one of the first narratives that we have of, you know, of one of our ancestors who was captured in the, you know, in, in Africa on the motherland mm -hmm. and brought here and he acquired his freedom. And, you know, we should know more about him. This man is an American hero. Uh, long story short, he was captured. His father, literally, when we hear people talk about, oh, my father, I'm my chief and I'm a prince. No, he literally was. Mm -hmm. um, his father, and unfortunately, because of that, in the area that he was in, as I told you about Mansa Musa, right. the area that he was in was, yeah. was, was part of you know what we know as the um, the gold co the the you know the the gold kingdom you know uh, so his father had a lot of gold and the story according to his narrative was that the slave raiders came and his father had made a deal and said hey if you leave me and my people alone I'll give you some of our gold and cattle so they took the gold and the cattle and you know another day or two later they heard that they were coming back to get what the rest of the gold and the cattle, mm -hmm. you know. So his father decided to break up his people. I guess he hid the gold. So, um, and, uh, you know, some people went east, northwest, and they left. And at e in the evening, apparently his father had set a fire, and the fire gave the tra raiders, you know, their direction. And unfortunately, he saw his father literally macheted to death. Wow. Um, not only that, then... He had to do an ordeal. He had to do a trek at six years old, roughly, of 600 miles from the interior of Africa to the ghost, coast of Africa. And I had a chance in 2001 to do a Fulbright uh, to spend about a month in Ghana. And I actually had a chance to go, you know, to uh, two of the, 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 the dungeons where we left from, where they have the doors of no return. And again, the one thing even all these years later, you know, mm. that still haunts mm. me is mm. the smell. Mm. It was just that you could still, it, it, oh. it made you nauseous, mm. you know, I mean, because that, so if, you, if it was that bad hundreds of years later, and if, can you imagine what it was like then? You know, because you, it's hot, you have these dungeons, you know, and at this time it was controlled by the Dutch and the British, and the way they, you know, I mean, the, the, the atrocities that our ancestors had to deal with to survive. It's a, well, no wonder that we're here today because um, I was speaking to some kids just to tell them how resilient we really are as a people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have gone through a lot less and haven't been here. So as I was telling you, Brotier had to do a journey of 600 miles from the interior to the coast. Now, let's think about these numbers. 30% would not make it you know, to the coast. Then when we get to the coast, then they get on the voyage. Another, according to Brotier's narrative, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know if he lost his mother, his siblings, but, you know, mm -hmm. there were, according to his narrative, there were 60 captives aboard the ship. And usually what happens is there's sickness and you have to throw them overboard. overboard. And so if we did an archaeological excavation of the Atlantic Ocean, just imagine the stories and the bodies that are told down there, you know, so, and, and again, you know. Now, did some people just, I mean, even if they didn't get thrown overboard, did some people just jump overboard because they did not want to? Well, of course, but again, yeah. uh, but, but this is money, so you know they don't want that to happen. And you bring up a good point because it goes back to show how, how the process, because our enslavement and our lack of citizenry in this country is not de facto. It's not because it's, it's, it's P.O. that, no, it's planned. And I'll give you a couple of uh, cases. So one of, the, one of the first case that deals with is slavery positive law? See, there's a book out that just came out recently called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, which talks about the redlining and how, you know, which kept black folks from being able to get uh, loans to get houses mm -hmm. during the 30s and especially after World War II. Mm -hmm. And this is why the median income 
for a black family of wealth in Boston, Massachusetts is $8. $8. Let's think about that. In California, I believe it's $300 after you take all depreciating assets mm -hmm. out. They say that only 10% of black family households make less than 10% make over $100,000 a year. Less than 5% of us have actually more than 350,000 of appreciable assets and less than 1% have over a million dollars in appreciable assets. Mm -hmm. You know, and now with inflation going 7.5% where it is, where does that leave us? Right. Right. You see? Mm -hmm. And so we really have to ask, what's the reason? So there was a court case. The first court case was in 1771. It was called uh, Somerset versus Stewart. Now, uh, Charles Stewart, I believe his name was, might not have been Charles, but the last name was Stewart, was a, was a Boston merchant, and he had purchased a captive named James Somerset. Mm -hmm. And he left Boston and went, uh, I mean, either he left Boston or Jamaica, I forget, mm -hmm. uh, and went to London. And so when he got, when James and them got to London, he was like, yo, I'm not feeling this. And, and again, in London, there was a free black population, and he runs away. Mm -hmm. Long story short, it goes to court, and there was a movie that interchanged two cases, uh, which I'll, leave, I'll bring up the next one. Um, but in that one, Judge Lord Mansfield said that in London, slavery was not positive law. So what do I mean by positive law or the color of law? So positive laws law, are laws that have been enacted through, legis uh, through Congress, have been passed by Congress. Mm -hmm. So like we're now dealing with a lot of what we call an executive order. So when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, that was an executive order. It had the color of law, but because Congress did not legislate it and pass it and approve it, it is not positive law. Therefore, it cannot be upheld in the court. See, so color just means it has the appearance of law, but it's really not enforceable. So this is why, you know, if you're, you feel your rights are deprived, mm -hmm. you know, over something that's not an amendment or where you haven't violated somebody's, you know, liberty, i.e. you haven't, you know, harmed them or stolen their property. Everything else, like, you know, crossing the street, that's, you know, a color of law, you know, and that right there is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand, so what, I, and so, so what he said was that slavery in London was not positive law. And at this time, 1771, remember, the America is still a colony of Britain, and we, cut, we follow what? English common law. Then you have another case, and this is the real most specific one. And this was uh, Greg, Gregson versus Gilbert, also known as the Zong Massacre. And this was in 1781-1782. And so Lloyd's of London where it was a coffee shop where a lot of insurance people would meet. And they had wrote a policy to insure the ship Zong, and which was at first it was a, a Dutch slip. Then the British took it over. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the ship then was sailing, got caught in the doldrums. And the captain and the crew panicked because any merchandise at this point as when, when our ancestors are caught and put on that ship, they're no longer human beings. Mm. We are now what? Cargo, property. So Lloyds of London wrote an insurance policy, let's understand this, to cover property. People property. No, 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 both property. Yeah, no, you know, no, let's not. So, all right. so uh, this is what I'm saying. So. Uh, so now that we're, once, you're ca once our ancestors have, have been captured, they are now property. property. And so what do you do? So th well, they got caught in the doldrum. Some got sick. And like we were saying, they threw them overboard to protect their what? Their interests. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the doldrums kept going. Even the healthy ones, they decided, well, hey, we got a policy. Healthy or not, throw them overboard. So apparently... One brother manages to survive. This is what I'm saying. We are some impossible people. How? We don't know, as uh, the story that I heard. And the story gets out, you know, that, you know, that these men, that they were healthy people that they threw overboard. So number one rule in insurance is what? Deny, deny, deny. And then if you can't deny, then you deduct, deduct, deduct. Mm -hmm. But so Lloyds of London said, wait a minute, we are not paying. 
You killed human beings. We're not paying for that. So the owners of the ship said, no, we did not. You insured a ship for proper cargo. This was cargo. It was defective cargo we had to get rid of. Now, uh, what would you think would the case court ruling be? That these are what? I mean, I'm still stuck on the, the, the point that we're talking about people and we're calling them cargo. cargo. Property. Yeah. Yes. This is what it is. No, you did not kill human beings. You just got rid of defective property. So this sets forth the policies, the, the, the capitalist policy that I mentioned earlier, profit before humanity, mm. profit over humanity. Now it gets us to, you know, now you have the Stewart case, which says that slavery is not positive law in London. Mm -hmm. Now you have the American, you know, uh, revolution. You know, you got the colonists fighting for their independence. So now that they're independent, how do we make slavery positive law in this country without saying it? Mm. You see, if you read the Constitution, you do not see the word slave, you do not see the word African, you do not see the word Negro, you don't even see the word white. Let's understand. Now, these are the smartest men in the world at this time. Mm -hmm. Bright, brilliant lawyers, theologians. Let's remember Connecticut. The only colony to have its own charter was founded by who? Lawyers and theologians. Mm. And so dealing with the court system, I used to joke about the language of the, the legal language and called it legalese. That's an actual term. And it's meant to be perplexing. So when we read the Constitution and you have that three-fifths, what does that really mean? They say, oh, it's just to determine representation because, oh, you know, the North didn't want, you know, the slaves in the South to be counted. But what about those of us who were free? You see? So why, would, why couldn't they have said, you know, this is what it is? But they were cowards. That's what you have to call them. They were hypocrites. And they had no morality. If you look at the Constitution, the Constitution is a great governing document, but it lacks morals and mm. ethics. Mm. Let's understand that. This is why we have so much corruption in our country today, because we do not have a moral document that governs our society. And it goes back to those two cases, Stood, uh, Somerset and Gilbert versus Gregson. Because again, slavery is not positive law in London, so we have to make it positive law in the United States because this is our property. And we want our, them to be property for perpetuity forever. And if you read what the framers were saying in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, let's look at the, the father of the Constitution, who was considered James Madison. Mm -hmm. Now, here's James Madison, very wealthy. Here's a man who knew life with, at the hands of our ancestors. We birthed a, it was a black woman that birthed him into the world. It was black hands that put him in the grave. And he knew no life without a black servant next to him. And one in particular was one named Billy. Now Billy was a servant when he was in Philadelphia during the Constitutional Convention. Now why is this important? Because you have white men talking about being free while you're owning another human being. Now, in Philadelphia, there's a very free black population. And one of the very first black millionaires was a, a, a very influential in the, the, the Americans getting their freedom was a man named James Fortune, mm. who was a shipmaker, you know, and told George Washington, listen, your troops are suffering because they have no clothes. So use, some, use the canvas on the tent to make some pants for them. You know, but we don't hear about him. George was so great, but here's a, a black man who knew the ships. So let's think about this. Our ancestors in the Nile Valley built pyramids. Sky, so you're going to tell me they couldn't build a ship that sailed up the Nile Valley to the Mediterranean, to the Atlantic? Yes, we've done that. This is why Ivan Van Sertimers, they came before Columbus. 
talks about Africans being in the Americas thousands of years, hundreds of years before Columbus. You know, there's the story of how Mansa Musa came to the throne. Mm -hmm. And it said that his uh, brother or his uncle, Abubakari II, had wanted to make a journey. And so he had sent first, uh, the story goes, there were a couple of 100 bo boats. And then on his second journey, 2,000 boats that left. And he never came back. And that's how Mansa Musa ascended to the throne. Now, archaeologically, we're still looking for those boats. I haven't. I don't know if they've discovered them as of yet. I need to do some more research. But as of to date, I don't believe they found any of Abubakari's boats. But we do, we, we do know that our ancestors had the knowledge to do that. I have, I have one question Please. for you, and this is just a personal question. <laughs> How in the world can you retain all of this information? I mean, I, I know that I'm sure that you go and you lecture and talk or whatever, and most people have. Um, some kind of documentation with their notes on it. And it's amazing to me that you can retain all of this. It just amazes me. Bob, I thank you, thank you, thank you. I guess it's, uh, just call it a gift. I guess, uh, you know, that's, that's the responsibility of, of being a griot or the jelly. You mm -hmm. know, those, uh, those were the roles that, you know, you, and, 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 and even today, if you're a chief, you have to have a Dejeli, like um, when you read the book Sundiata of an Epic of Old Mali. Mm -hmm. In order to be a chief, you have to have a Dejeli because the Dejelis were the ones who knew the history of the people, of the village, of kings, of relationships, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, you know, it's just a, a gift that I've had to be able to retain dates and information. Um, and then having those discussions, you know, we would go down down south sometimes for, for, for the holidays, mm -hmm. you know, and especially when I went off to school, college, you know, we go off to school, they sent you to get educated. So I came back educated, <laughs> using big words, <laughs> thinking I'm doing something, <laughs> and I'm down having ta and talking, and my grandmother looking at me like, boy, you done a stone cold fool. You using all them big words. Boy, put it so the, put it so the pigs can get it. I'm like, huh, baby, you got the trough up here. I don't understand them big <laughs> words. Bring it down here. So, you know, it made me realize that, you know, I am going to school to learn, you know, who we are, what our purpose is, you know, our achievements. Uh, one of the first books that really got me started uh, was your father and my father. Mm -hmm. You know, he got me a book because uh, he realized I was really into history. Um, and someone we really don't know about locally here, John A. Rogers, who, they, who went to Weaver. Um, but he was a great, great uh, scholar, historian, writer, um, and got me on the journey. He he, two, two of his first books that he wrote, uh, one was uh, Superman to Man. Mm -hmm. Now, I want people to think about this. He wrote that in 1917. Schuster and Siegel, who created Superman, didn't do their Superman until 1933. And when, and when you read Superman to Man, or World's Great Men of Color, actually, um, he talks about all the great pharaohs, you know, of the Nile Valley, you know, um, during that period to say, wait a minute, these are all black men, black women who look like you and I, who built and started what we know as civilization. Now, no one can actually give you any real concrete dates on the Nile Valley dynasties. Mm -hmm. Those are all conjectures because I tell people this all the time and, you know, University of Chicago is the school of, e in America, the school of Egyptology. And even the Egyptologists will tell you that the hieroglyphs have never been properly deciphered. But what we forget to realize is that just like we have emojis today, right. emojis right. are not the alphabet, correct? Right. We, right. We, right? right. So, now we had the hieroglyphs, which were the ancient emojis, you can say, mm -hmm. you know, but our ancestors had and gave the world the very first writing. We don't know that, do we? It was called the, hered first it was the heretic script, and the heretic script was the sacred spiritual script, you know, that, 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 was you, that our ancestors had. And eventually that script and its interpretations got lost over time. And then they create, they had the demotic script, which was more of 
everyday language, administrative language. And this right here was the language that was, you know, around when Alexander came into the Nile Valley. And what people don't realize is that, again, there were, Alexander was not a Greek. He was a Macedonian. Mm. You see? Now, during that period, when they tell us about Greek history, they, we, we learn about Sparta and we learn about Athens. Where's Macedonia? Where did they? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Alexander comes on the scene. So it makes me question. Hmm. Because again, when I read and I see the movie uh, 300, which talks about the Spartans and how they are a very what? War and militaristic right. people. Right. So if you're a very warlike, militaristic people, when do you have time to think, to come up with literature, to philosophize, when you're constantly fighting? When do you have time to come up with the language? So if they say Alexander was the very first Western Asian to come into the Nile Valley, who was what? Illiterate, barbaric, and savage. These are the facts. They, the, 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 the Greek language did not have an alphabet. It was our ancestors, the Melchite Coptic Egyptians, who gave the Greek language its alphabet, mm -hmm. just like we gave the Latin language its alphabet. So when we look at history, as I said before, there is no Roman history prior to before 1445. Prior to that, they were the Latins. So when Alexander came on the scene in 320, 332, he passed away in 323 and his general Ptolemy takes over. And from 323 to 30 BCE, we don't talk about the Ptolemaic dynasty that ruled Egypt. Now we heard of Cleopatra. Right. You know, remember there are seven Cleopatras, but that's those Cle Cleopatra reigned during the Ptolemaic dynasty. And then after the Ptolemaic dynasty, that's when you have the Latins coming in. And it's the Latins that, that are in there all the way up until uh, pretty much three, three, yeah, around, around 300 is when you start having this, the, the Latin empire split between the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire, and this is where we get Constantine. So after Constantine defeats Maximus, Maximilius, you know, he then brings the, the, the power and the seat of Latin, the Latin Empire, to what, he, what, was then call, what he then calls Constantinople mm -hmm. after him. And Constantinople then becomes the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire then becomes the Ottoman Empire, the, which, is the, which then becomes what we know as Palestine, you know, in 1917 after World War I, and then uh, by, well, after World War II, 1948, we have what is the creation of now we know as the Middle East. See, but all that right there is where, was at one point Constantinople and Byzantium, but even, the, even now it's still, those are all its political names. As I said, we have to remember geologically that land is what? Northeast Africa. Let's remember that. So now, none, all of the, the things that you, you're um, speaking about today, none of this is taught in the, in the schools. Have school. you ever heard of it? No. Of course not. No. No. It's critical race theory they're talking about. We can't learn about these things. So, um, and I tell people, so we have, as I was mentioning, the Constitution. You know, right after the Constitution was ratified, you know, um, it then becomes who are we as, as a people? What, what, what does that three-fifths do for those of us who are free and enslaved? So one of the first cases that we, that, that we start looking at of, of, of what is, you know, what, 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 what can we do with a slave? So there's a case in North Carolina, 1829, North Carolina versus man. So a uh, gentleman, rented out one of his slaves and the person he rented out to, you know, just pretty much abused them, you know. And so what was the compense? And because this is property, these aren't human beings, you can do what you want. That's 1829. Then here in Connecticut, one of the very first cases was Crandall versus the state of Connecticut. There's an assistant uh, uh, named uh, Prudence Crandall. She was a Quaker. 
out of uh, Rhode Island and she wanted to open up a school for girls and she decided to open up in the town of Canterbury. And again, like I said, we had very free black folks and we had a, a young girl whose family was free and had money and wealthy and they could afford to pay the tuition. Her name was Sarah Harris. And, you know, she was light, bright, and as we say, almost white. You couldn't even tell. I mean, <laughs> and wanted to go to school. And now when the town folks found out about it, they were heated. They were upset. We don't want no N-word going to our school. And I give, now at first, Prudence Crandall was reluctant, you know, and I still believe even though Prudence Crandall is the state heroine, it should be Prudence Crandall and Sarah Harris because Sarah Harris was the impetus, I believe, from my perspective, mm. to force it. And so, you know, but to Prudence's uh, credit, she stuck by, you know, what she, her, she stood her ground on that issue. And so when the white folks said, you know what, well, we'll take our daughters out of school. You know, and she was like, fine. So she put an ad in the, I believe it was Deliberated, the paper by William Lloyd Garrison, saying she had a school for girls and it was open up to color. So, you know, it went all around out. So the next season, she, you had, uh, you got, you know, you know, how, you know how we do when we do it and we got it. You know, I, they came in with carriages that, you know, had the, probably the Clydesdales, the leather interior. You know, you know how we spoil our girls, our daddy, you know. So, you, so now you see white people seeing, you know, all these black girls coming in in these nice carriages, you know, and they're, they're not happy. So then they said, well, we're not going to sell you any goods. No problem. We'll send you care packages. Then that doesn't work. So you know what? When they don't get their way, they do what they do best. Like I said earlier, they know nothing but violence. That's their nature, unfortunately. I hate to say it. I wish it was not true. But when you study Western Asian history, I have yet to find a 10-year period where they have not been warring with one another. There's always a war going on. Look at what's going on right now. I mean, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, why, are, why, why now that... You know, there's always a, an invisible enemy lurking in this country, especially at, ever since the passing of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, because that right there was their way of creating, you know, a tax to get us to pay for their wars. If you look at all the wars since 19, ever since the passage of the, the Federal Reserve Act, I mean, there wasn't that many right run out, but you have World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the Korean War, the Cold War, the Korean War, you see, the Vietnam War, the Cold War again, then the war on terrorism, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, all these wars, wars, wars. Why? Why do we spend all our money, you know, when what, over 50 percent of our, our budget is going to, to the defense when we got enough nuclear weapons to knock everybody out? It's absurd. These people, why we have a war department, why don't we have a peace department? Ah, so I never thought of that. <laughs> right. But again, because these people are greedy. Let's just understand that. This is why they don't want us to understand that we are not citizens. So it goes back to the next case. So in the Constitution, there's this provision in the same section two, which says the importation of such persons. Who are these such persons? Shall not be prohibited prior to 1808. Who are they talking about? You see, so the three-fifths clause is to keep us property for perpetuity. When the framers wrote, we the people, in 1787, we weren't including in we the people. So you have the Amistad case, where you have Judge Taney. Now, I bring him up because he is very important for the next case, which is the Dred Scott. Now, the Amistad case, it was said that the Amistad captives were taken from Africa by the Spaniards, brought to Cuba, and they were, being, they were getting ready to go from uh, one port in Cuba to another port in Cuba. They hijacked the ship, you know, as they were going, and the ship was caught in Long Island Sound, mm -hmm. you know. And as a matter of fact, the very first trial happened in Hartford, Connecticut at the Old State House. Mm -hmm. And again, who are they? Are they slaves? Are they Africans? born free? Well, who, what's their status? And when they came to the court, they found out that they were born in Africa pro after 1807 and 1808, which meant that they were born free. And therefore, because they were born free, they were captured illegally. And then 
must be set free. However, 16 years later, 1857, Dred Scott, born in 1799, I believe, somewhere around that time, you know, with our ancestors and captivity, you know, we don't really, the, the, the documentation really isn't there a lot of the time, but we do know that he was born before the year 1808. So now, the question before the court is, does a Negro whose ancestors, born free or enslaved, do they, are they considered people, persons, and citizens according to the Constitution? Now, everybody says Tawny is racist. It was the most horrendous decision that they could have made. We already know all of them were racist. It was the thought of the day. But if he was such a racist, why did he say that the Amistad captives and that court that he was on mm -hmm. 16, 15, 16 years earlier say that the Amistad Africans must be set free? Because if he was that much of a real racist, you know, he would have found a way to enslave those Amistad captives. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the Constitution, people always say, well, you can't get justice. Well, we do have instances. Sojourner Truth yeah. went to the courts to get the, you know, when the laws were passed of the gradual emancipation, she got her son back, you know. And there are instances where individually we can petition to be citizens, but it has to be approved. And there was an instance by a man named Quack Walker who served in the um, American Revolution, wanted to be a citizen, and had all of the, his, his friends, whites, who sh served with him in the American Revolution, vouch for him, and he was able to. So there are ways. So even Tawny, when he says that, and, and he even brings Connecticut in, he said if any state were to have, or colony, were to have recognized you know, Negroes as citizens, it would have been Connecticut. And even Connecticut did not recognize us as such. I mean, Connecticut has, or New London had ordinances as far back as 1660, which forbade us for buying land and owning property. You have the Connecticut Bla Black Codes as early as 1691, which restricted our movement uh, all over the place. Uh, you know, there was an article in, um, about, I'd say, almost 20 years ago in the Hartford Current called Complicity, which talks about the complicit role that here in Connecticut we play. There's a town, Wethersfield, made its money selling red onions to the Caribbean. You know, you have a town in Essex, Ivoryton, you know, made its money from the slave trade, the East African slave trade, and the ivory trade. This is why it's called Ivorytown. So, Michael, question for you. If, you if, if anybody wanted to have you come to lecture, um, do you go out and do, do that? You know, if yeah, I've, uh, I've done things uh, uh, in the tri-state area. I've spoken at the New Lots Library um, in, in Brooklyn, New York. They actually have a, um, uh, a burying ground right across the street mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the library there. And we act actually, actually had... Uh, some adult learners do um, a service, uh, what I call a surface excavation, mm -hmm. um, which pretty much means you're just picking up, because as, archae as, as archaeologists, pretty much all we do is we look at the things people leave behind, the material objects, and try to interpret what their usages are, how the people used it. And I'm telling you, so we pretty much did that, and I, w and I went to the community. One of the things that Dr. Perry says, you know, when you're going in, you have to treat those in the community as who they are, and they are experts. So you are the experts of your community. There are certain nuances, you know, that people do different places, you know. Um, so it's like you're the expert. So I don't know these things, but what we're going to do is we're going to look around this area. So first we're going to do the demographics, i.e., who are the people who live around here? You know, what's the community? What's the makeup? you know, the ethnicity, how much, what's the socioeconomic structure, how much do they make, what are we seeing? So as they look around, they're picking up cigarette butts, uh, cigar wrappers, you know, trash, scat, and if you don't know what that is, that just means, you know, feces and stuff like that mm -hmm. from animals. And so all this stuff you have to look at, and then in their groups, they pick it up, and then they decipher. What does, what is, now this is all you have, but the thing is, you're not 100 years down the road. 
500 years, you're here now. What can you determine about your community from the evidence that you see right here on the ground? Yes, I wanted to, um, I wanted to know if we could like put up, if, if you have contact information so that oh. if somebody wanted to contact you because uh, you, have, you have so much, <laughs> ah, so much knowledge and information. Uh, I think it would be great to have you to, oh. but I know you do that already, right? Yeah, we do that. Um, one uh -huh. of the things that we do do, we'll be doing, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I like to do is, uh, because a lot of this stuff is, can be intense, mm -hmm. you know, it causes a lot of conversations I get into, causes a lot of cognitive dissonance with people. Um, so one of the things that I use and I find to break it down is I, we, we, I have a, a program called Griot World where we use puppets, storytelling, and music and songs mm -hmm. to tell our story and share our story. Um, so I was fortunate to get a grant through the Connecticut Economic and Development. Um, and so in April, April 2nd, we're going to be doing a puppet show at E224 Ecospace. Okay. Um, so we're asking people to come. Uh, we're just asking a suggested donation of uh, ten dollars. We're also anybody who's a vendor. We're looking for vendors who are family oriented. Okay. Uh, we're asking. We have limited space, but we're only asking fifty dollars, and that includes a table and chair. Um, okay. So we want to be able to, you know, generate, you know, uh, community okay. opportunity, economic. So having our uh, our small businesses come in, have people to come through to have a good show um, and support small businesses. So we're, we're, we're not really, we don't sell tickets, but we are asking a small donation of $10 for adults, a dollar for a child. So your um, contact information, um, you, what contact, how, how would someone contact uh, you? Our email is uh, griotworldharlem at gmail.com, that's G-R-I-O-T. W O R L D H A A R L E M and I'll at have them Gmail. Put it, uh, yeah, I have to put a, put that up on the screen. I know we need probably do a uh, a time check, but uh, yeah, you said I think we got about what ten more minutes, <laughs> five more minutes. So, um, but to go back to one of the things that I was saying earlier about us not being citizens mm -hmm. uh, and what we need to do and what you know, even Tani says. So I think uh, you know, growing up, I've always heard that expression. Reading is fundamental, mm -hmm. but there's another, I added another component, and I've realized over the years that, but comprehension is essential. A lot of us read, but do we really understand what we read? And even as a scholar, as I read certain legal documents, historical documents, and how it's written, I have to read it over and over again, because sometimes I'm like, what in the world are they mm -hmm. saying? You read the Constitution, and again, you're like, wait a minute, why, why couldn't you have just said this? So again, when we read, everybody says, oh, no, 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 Dred Scott was overturned by the 13th and 14th Amendment. However, when we look at the 13th Amendment, and Ava DuVernay did a, did a great documentary on the 13th, you know, which says what? Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except there's that loophole as a punishment for a crime. So it never ends slavery. And again, it never refers to black, white, or anything else. Mm -hmm. Then the 14th Amendment says all persons if I'm not mistaken. However, remember, Dred Scott says we are not people, persons, or citizens. So if we are not people, persons, or citizens, and it doesn't specifically state that, then why do we need the Voting Rights Act? Why does that have to be renewed? Because we are not citizens. Does an immigrant who becomes a naturalized citizen, do they need a naturalized immigrant voting rights? No, they become citizens. You're either a citizen or you're not. There's not a mistake when McConnell said African Americans vote as much as Americans because they're telling you we are not Americans, we are not citizens. You know, the 14th Amendment, when you listen to the pundits, they always say the 14th Amendment was intended. Intended. It's always intended for the freedmen, those who were formerly enslaved. But when we look at it, who was, we don't, we, they never tell us who was the drafter of the 14th Amendment. A uh, New York attorney named Roscoe Conklin. And he specifically said in a court case of uh, Southern Pacific versus Santa Clara, because wh why he is so important is because he is the only U.S. Supreme Court 
justice to be nominated and confirmed, and he denied it because he wanted to make more money at this time with the railroad companies. Mm -hmm. And so he represented the railroad company, and one of the things that, you know, people think that the court ruled on it, but if I'm not mistaken, the court never made a ruling on it. But it was, it was he said, allegedly had said that he chose the word person to include corporations, because we have to remember, a person is not a natural human being. A person is a literary incarnation. This is why we have that literary device called personification, which gives an inanimate object human attributes, but is not a human. This is why, you know, in 2010, the Supreme Court said Citizens United was a person, because a person is not a natural human being. And so the 14th Amendment, had the 14th Amendment said all persons, including those formally classified as three-fifths, then we would then be positive citizens. Now remember this, I tell people this all the time. You know, you had in 1894, the Supreme Court ruled that the income tax was unconstitutional. If you read the Constitution, no tax, no tax, no tax. But in 1913, going back to the feds, they persuaded Congress to pass, I believe it was the 16th Amendment, which put the income tax into the Constitution. Right? Now, just as you can put something into the Constitution, you can take it out. For example, prohibition. Prohibition, alcohol, illegal. Then what did they do? They what? Repealed it. So it's not that hard. It doesn't take much. But the thing is, how are you going to get each 50 states, because that's how it has to be done. So I tell people, if you're tired of seeing the injustices that we're seeing. Contact your legislators. I've been dealing with this issue definitely since uh, 2017, if not longer. 2019, I reached out to Representative Bobby Gibson to talk about this. No feedback. I reached out to Doug McCrory. No feedback. You know, i am reaching, been reaching out. No one wants to touch this issue. So those in the listening audience, if this means something, if you're tired of seeing black men, black women unnecessarily murdered, if you're tired of seeing the disproportionate, you know, jail sentences, because again, what comes with citizenship? Rights, privileges, mm -hmm. and the other factor is immunities. We don't get those immunities. That's, uh, that's the issue. When we have that citizenship, we can then have those immunities, and then which makes the state responsible if they violate that. But hey, we're not citizens. We're still an ambiguous people. So if you don't mind, uh, there's a, a piece that I'd like to, uh, a poem that I'd like to end with, if, oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, sure. if that's OK with you. I guess you can just look into, where's your camera? Oh, your camera. And my camera over there. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but no, so those are some of the things that um, uh, we need to uh, think about politically. You know, especially you see what's going on. We saw what happened when, our, uh, when we went out and um, voted Biden in. What did the Republicans start doing in Georgia? They started the gerrymandering. Look what's going on in Texas. And because it's not in the news, we're not hearing about all the gerrymandering that's going on. However, if we become positive citizens, they can't gerrymander us out of the vote because it's within our constitutional right. But we have to understand that. But uh, um, this is what, what I call, it's called, Who Are We? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a statement that um, uh, former, uh, I believe, the Attorney General Eric Holder said, who are we as a nation? Are we cowards? So it just rung out in my mind. So it just says, who are we? Who are we as a nation? Are we cowards or Haitians? Do we fight or do we run? Pick up the sword and the gun or simply party and have fun? Who are we from the mountains to the sea? Who will we be by the next century? Coast to coast from Miami to Maine, will we ever remove the human stain? They say one drop is all it takes as our mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers were raped by bastards of barons and lords, but, by, but mama and papa followed the drinking gourd to take us from this place, but her name means I am race, <laughs> and we can't escape our face. 
Here we are in 2021 with nowhere to run. We still wear the mask. Why are we afraid to ask Congress, what are they going to do for us? It makes me want to cuss. So what are we going to do? Continue to vote for the red and blue? The wolf or the fox? Put your vote in a box. It doesn't matter who wins because they're cousins and they're twins. Such a shame that we don't know the game or understand the system which keeps us lame. Given Chicken George's children fame, who are we in this land? Property or brand? Making trillions for the man. Reparations is subrogation, not a helping hand. But a right and our claim to this land we proclaim. Our ancestors died in blood and change. They're the ones who grew rice, indigo, cottons, corn, and grains. But who are we in this land when the Constitution says we are still three-fifths a man? Wow. 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 Yeah. So. Michael, I want to thank you. You feel like my little brother. Well, you pretty yeah, much were my brother. big sister. I pretty <laughs> much grew up with you. I thank you so much for coming in and I just, like I said, I'm blown away by, oh, thank you. by your knowledge. Thank you. And, I appreciate um, it. I'm hoping that people who would love to have you come and lecture would get your information and, and, um, and um, okay. contact you because yeah. you really have, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of information. So I'd just like to thank you. And uh, did you, any, any final thing you want to say? Uh, no, just thank you. I hope everybody is uh, staying healthy and safe out there. Remember to... Uh, you know, just practice healthy hygiene, active, eat healthy, you know, and understand and read your history. Know your history, as we say, Sankofa. You know, that right there is actually the metaverse before the metaverse. It's we, as our ancestors talked about the past, present, and the future all in one. So, so I think oh, one other thing I do want to mention is that, as I said, at, at the CCSU, we do an annual conference. We're having a conference, I believe it's March 4th, the first Thursday of March, uh, where we have an uh, annual conference, and this year it's going to be on um, mental health and wellness. So you'll tune in, and I can get you that information yes, please do, for please that. Do. So, yeah. All right, again, thank you, and I appreciate I uh, Thank you, too. And I thank you all for watching. I hope you learned something that you didn't know before. I'm sure you learned a lot that you didn't know before, because I did, too. So I thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Be blessed. Thank <laughs> you.